Section 8.3 talks about functions. So let's figure out a little bit about functions today. And it says, consider the function machine in figure 16. It says, for the function named f, what happens when the numbers 0, 1, 3, 4, and 6 are input? Okay, so we take a look here. We're going to input whatever our x is. And when we do that, whatever number we have, we're going to add 3 to it. Okay, so let's see. My function f of x, according to what we have right here, is equal to x plus 3, right? And we're going to input, <coughs> excuse me, each of these numbers here. So let's find 0. So we're going to take 0, we're going to add 3 to it. We're still going to end up with 3. We're going to input 1. We're going to add 3 to it, and we end up with 4. We're going to input 3. Oops. And we are going to add 3 to it. We're going to get 6. We're going to input 4. We're going to add 3 to it. We're going to get 7. And finally, we're going to input 6. We're going to add 3 to it, and we're going to get 9. Okay, so <clears throat> this is what a function looks like. We're going to be doing something with our input value, okay? So in this case, all we did with our input value was we added 3. All right, so what we have right here is the definition of a function. It says a function from a set A to a set B is a correspondence from A to B in which each element of A is paired with one and only one element of B. A is what we call the domain of the function, and B is what we call the codomain of the function, okay? So again, no notice, these were elements of our set A, and we had a correspondence to our set B. What did we do? We added three to each of those elements, and so these numbers here would be my set, elements of my set B, my codomain, okay? They were our outputs. All right. So let's see if we can figure out the next problem that we have here. It says a bicycle manufacturer incurs a daily fixed cost of $1,400 for overhead expenses and a cost of $500 per bike manufactured. Part A says find the total cost C. The way I read this right here, guys, again, you might remember this from college algebra, C of X. Okay, the little parentheses, I read them as of. So C of X. Find the total cost C of X of manufacturing X bikes in a day. Okay, so let's do part A first. So part A, C of X equals, for every bike that we make, it's gonna cost us $500, okay? 500, remember what X stands for. X is the number of bikes that we make in a day. So 500 times X. In addition to those $500, it's gonna cost us to make each bike we also have a daily fixed cost of $1,400. So what's that daily fixed cost? That would be like, you know, the light bill, the water bill, the internet bill, utilities, things like that, okay? So plus $1,400, okay? Now, there's a part B. Right here, it says, part B says, if the manufacturer sells each bike for $700, and the profit or loss in producing X bikes a day is P of X, find P of X in terms of X. Okay, so let's figure out exactly what did that sentence say. Okay, they're going to sell each bike for 700 Okay, this is, we usually have something called the revenue. The revenue just means how much money we are bringing in, okay? Money brought in. So I'm going to come up with a function R of X, okay, my revenue function. And it says for every bike that we sell, we're going to bring in $700, okay? Now, it's asking us to find a profit function, okay, profit or loss. So the way we find the profit function, guys and girls, is we're going to take the revenue and we're going to subtract the cost, okay? So remember, this is the money that we bring in. This is how the money that we spent, right? So whatever is left over would be profit if it's a positive number. Or if it's negative, it would actually be a loss, right? 
Okay, so let's do this. So I'm going to write 700x minus, now here is my cost function. I need to put all this business, guys, in parentheses. Okay. All right. So now, oops, get my pen going again. Oh, come on. Don't give me any problems right now. There we go. Okay. So P of X equals 700 X. Remember, I can think of this here as a negative one. I'm just going to distribute that. So minus 500 X minus 1400. And so P of X equals seven minus five is going to be 200 X minus $1,400. Okay. This is my profit function. Okay. So now there's a part C. Part C right here says find the break even point. That is the number of bikes X produced sold per day that results in either a profit or a loss. So we're looking for the break even point. We don't want to have a profit, so we don't want to make any money. We don't want to have a loss, so we don't want to lose any money. Well, if we don't have a profit and we don't have a loss, all that tells me is that the profit is going to be equal to zero. So I'm just going to take our equation that we have right here, people, and I'm going to set it equal to zero, and then I'm going to solve. So, oh, come on. My pen is freezing up again. Sorry about that, guys. There we go. Okay, so let's add 1,400 to both sides. So now I get 200x equals 1,400. When we divide both sides by 200, x is equal to, let's get rid of that, let's get rid of that, 14 divided by 2 is 7. <clears throat> so what does that mean? This means, let me kind of scooch this over here. Okay. What this means is we need to sell 7 bikes to break even. Okay. So anything if we sell anything less than 7, we're going to lose money. If we sell anything more than 7, then we're going to make money because that 7 is going to be my break even point, okay? All right. <clears throat> so we got a little picture here, let's see if we can figure it out. It says identify functions with arrow diagrams. So it says, Jonah is shipping five boxes for his uncle. Each box is the same size, but a different weight. The cost to ship each, uh, each box is shown. Should Jonah expect that the cost to ship a 15-pound box will be a unique cost? Okay, so let's see if we can figure this thing out. <clears throat> so it says right here, uh, organize the data using pairs. So let's see, an 8-pound box is $8.56. A nine pound box, 872. 10 pound box, 901. Uh, 12 pound box, 955. 14 pound box, 1003. Okay. And so now look what they're doing. They're doing this. This is going to be my domain. And this one here will be our co domain. Oops. domain okay so when the box is eight pounds it costs 856 when it's nine pounds 872 so on and so forth <clears throat> so it says a relation is a function when each input is a, is assigned exactly one output so this is a function because every weight has a particular cost right so would a 15 pound box have a unique cost yes it would i don't know what it would be but it's only going to be one amount, right? I couldn't say I'm going to send a, a box that weighs 15 pounds and it's going to cost this much on Monday and this much on Wednesday. Nothing like that, right? It's because it, they're just basing it on the weight. Okay, so let's see. There's another little part here. It says uh, Joe needs to advertise his company. He considers several different brochures of different side lengths and areas. He presents the data as ordered pairs. So this is the side length and this is going to be the area. Side length and area, side length and area, because it tells me that right here. 
Okay, so it says complete the arrow diagram and is the area of a brochure a function of the side length? Okay, so let me come back here a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to look at these ordered pairs, okay? So let's look at the one that has the smallest first number, the smallest side length, which was 2. See how 2 is paired up with 20 and that's why they have that little arrow? 2 is being paired up with 20, okay? So... The next smallest side length would be 4. And 4 is being paired up with 24. 5 is being paired up with 35. Uh, let's see. 8 is being paired up with 24. And 9 is being paired up with 27. Okay, so it's asking me, is this a function? Okay, so the easiest way to think about this when we have this kind of a diagram here is a lot of times they call these relations, okay? So think about a relationship. Okay, in a relationship, everybody in the domain needs to be faithful. So everybody in this set right here cannot be a cheater, okay? So look, 2 is hooking up with 20. They're not cheating. 4 is hooking up with 24. They're not cheating. 5 is going to 35. They're not cheating. 8 is going to 24. 8 is not cheating. 9 is going to 27. So a lot of times people say, but hold on, isn't 24 cheating? 24 we can say is cheating. But in order for it to be a function... These guys here have to be the ones that are faithful, and they are, okay? So, look what the next part here. It says, there are two outputs of 24. Does this help determine whether the relation is a function? No, it doesn't, right? Because we're not so concerned about our codomain as we are concerned about our domain, okay? So, everybody in the domain needs to be faithful, Okay? So, if I keep going here, it says, uh, which of any of the parts in figure 18 exhibit a function from A to B? Okay, and it says, if the correspondence is a function from A to B, find the range of a function. Okay, so we'll talk about the range. Oh, let me, there we go. We'll talk about the range right now as well. Okay, so first thing we're going to do, we're going to look at our domain. Is everybody here being faithful? Is anybody cheating? And we would say yes. Look, one is cheating. One is going to the square root of two, and one is also going to the square root of four. So this one here, oops, this one here is not a function. Okay. All right. So again, everybody here needs to be faithful. Everybody here needs to pair up with one person over there. Notice what the problem is. B. B is not going anywhere. Everybody here needs to be paired up with somebody here. So this is also not a function. Okay. All right. So now let's look at this next part. Is everybody here being faithful? X is going to A. X is not cheating. Y is going to C. Y is not cheating. Z is going to be, Z is not cheating. So yes, this one here is a function. Now it says when we find a function, we're going to find the range. Okay, so what the range is going to be are the values that, get, that are getting paired up over here. So the ones that are actually paired up are A, B, and C. All right, same thing here. Let's see, look. John is not cheating. Mike is not cheating. Joan is not cheating. Sue is not cheating. So this here is, again, a function. And our range is going to be Brown, Smith, and Doe. 
And I'm sure you can tell that this here is also a function. And my range will be one half, four thirds, seven fifths, 10 over nine, okay? So a lot of times people say, what's the difference between a range and the codomain? So notice what the range was here. It was just A, B, and C. The codomain oops, would be not only A, B, C, but it would also include D, okay? D was not part of the range because nobody got sent to D, but that would still be part of our codomain. All right, just a little clarification there. Okay, so now, a couple of ways we can do this next problem. It says, which of the following sets of ordered pairs represent functions? If a set represents a function, give the domain and the range, and if it does not, explain why. Okay, so I'm going to show you two ways to do this problem. Okay. So here's my set A, and it's 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, 4. Okay, so the domain, when I have pairs like this, are going to be my x values, and my range are going to be my y values, okay? So look, let's go like this, domain and range. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down my x values. So remember, my x values are the first ones. So I have 1. I have 1 again. I'm not going to write it twice. I have 2, and I have 3. And then my range are going to be y, my y values. So 2, 3. I got 3 again and 4. So I don't need to write 3 twice. 2, 3, and 4. And now I'm going to draw my arrows, okay? So look, 1 is going to 2. 1 is also going to 3. 2 is going to 3, and 3 is going to 4. So when I look at this, the first thing I notice here is that 1 is cheating. So we're going to say not a function because when x equals 1, y has two values, right? Okay, so that's one way you can do it. You can actually draw the picture like we did in the, in the problem before. If you don't want to draw the picture, what you can do is, as you look at this, if you notice that the x value of 1 repeats itself, then it's not going to be a function. So only if the x value repeats itself, okay? So first thing I'm going to do here, I'm going to look at, oops, I'm going to look at this one here. My highlighter. Here we go. I'm going to look at this one here. Look at my x values. One, two, three, four. Do they repeat themselves? No. So part B, we have a function. Okay. My domain is my x values, which are one, two, three, and four. My range, which are my y values, are going to be one half one-third, one-fourth, and one-fifth, okay? Let's do part C. Okay, I'm going to look at my x values. Do any of my x values repeat? I have one, two, three, and four. None of my x values repeat. Oops. None of my x values repeat. So again, we have a function. My domain are my x values, which are 1, 2, 3, and 4. And my range are my y values, which are, my y values are only 0 and 4. Okay. And then part D, as in dog, do we have a function here? Okay. So I want you to look at what we got. It says uh, we're looking at pairs A, B where A is an element of N. Okay, so all that means is A are natural numbers. Natural numbers look like this, guys. One, two, three, four, so on and so forth, okay? B are going to be 
whatever these numbers are times 2. So look, let's just start writing them out for a little bit. 2, 2 times 2, 4, 2 times 3, 6, 2 times 4, 8, so on and so forth, right? And if I were to think about like a pairing, like the way we did here, 1 goes to 2 because we doubled it, 2 goes to 4, 3 goes to 6, 4 goes to 8. So again, yeah, we got a function. There's nobody here that gets paired up with two different numbers. 4 doesn't go to 8 and also to like 12, right? Because all we're doing is doubling them. And my domain are my first numbers, which are the natural numbers. Okay, It's like a funny looking N. And my range are A is equal to 2B. Okay, we're just the doubles of those numbers. All right. Okay, let's keep scrolling along over here. Let's see. All right. So this problem here says, the following graph shows the relationship between the number of cars on a certain road and the time of day for times between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. Okay. So let's take a look here. So these are my times. And then these are the number of cars at those particular times, right? Okay, so part A says, what was the increase in the number of cars on the road between 6.30 a.m. and 7 a.m.? So if this is 6 and this is six, uh, 7, I'm sorry, this is going to be 6.30, right? We want to know how much did the cars increase from here to here. This looks like 600, that looks like 650. So about 50 cars, right? Okay. During which half hour was the increase in the number of cars the greatest? Okay. We want to know when it was the greatest. So what we're looking for is um, when was it the steepest? Okay. So it looks like between 6 and 6.30, it was the steepest. So between 6... And 6.30. All right. What was the increase of cars in the number of cars between 8 and 8.30? So between 8 and 8.30, we didn't have any increase, right? Because it stayed the same. It stayed flat right here, right? Okay. During which half hour did the number of uh, cars decrease and by how much? So when did the cars start going down? Between 8.30 and 9.00. And how much did it go down by? From 700, it went down to 600. So it went down by 100 cars. Okay. And it says the graph for this problem is composed of segments rather than just points. Why do we think segments are used here? Because you don't just... So let's think about it this way. Remember, it went down 100 cars, right? Between 830 and 9. And it's not like it... At, you know, we know between 8.30 and 9, it went down by 100 cars, but it wasn't like an instant. It didn't, wasn't like, okay, now it's 8.30, and then a second later, it's 9. It's 30 minutes later, right? And those number of cars are decreasing at a particular rate. So this is why we need our segments, you know? So we would just say, like, the number of cars per time was, or we can say is, Continuous. The time is going to be continuous, right? Time doesn't just, it's not like a discrete number. Okay. All right. So now we have another couple of questions about functions. And it says, which of the following graphs of functions are, I'm sorry, which of the following are graphs of functions and which are not? Okay. So again, you might remember this from college algebra. If you don't, I'm going to tell you right now. There's something called the vertical line test. The vertical line test says if you can draw a vertical line, vertical lines go like this, guys, by the way. They go up and down. If you can draw a vertical line, if it only hits your graph one time, then you got a function. So what do I mean by that? Did I hit the graph once and only once? Yes. Did I hit the graph once and only once? Yes. No matter how many times I do this, I'm only going to hit my graph one time for every line that I draw. So what we have here is... 
a function. Okay. Now, what happens when I do this? How many times am I hitting this line? I'm hitting that line all the time. So this would not be a function. Okay. And the same thing here, if I draw my vertical line, no matter how many vertical lines I draw, I'm always going to hit the graph just once. So again, we've got a function. All right, so the next part here, it's got four little parts to it, okay? So I'm going to do this in pieces. And it says, consider the function f of z equals 2z minus 9 over 2z plus 1. Find all possible inputs for the following outputs, okay? So what we mean by outputs, guys, these are going to be my values for f of z, Okay. So what I'm going to do is everywhere I have the, the little term f of z, I'm going to replace it now with the number 2. So 2 equals 2z minus 9 over 2z plus 1. Okay. So I'm going to try to show you the easy breezy cover goal way of doing this problem. I'm going to think of this 2 as 2 over 1. And all I'm going to do now, guys, is cross multiply. So 1 times all of this is still going to be 2z minus 9. And then 2 times all of this, I'm going to distribute that 2. 2 times 2z would be a 4z plus 2. Just like we did before, I'm going to solve for the letter z. Okay, so I'm going to draw my little vertical line. I'm going to move my 2z this way just because I feel like it. So minus 9 equals 4 minus 2, 2z plus 2. Now I'm going to minus 2 on both sides. So negative 11 equals 2z. So when I divide by 2 for part A, oops, I'm going to get z equals negative 11 over 2. Okay. All right, let's do the same thing for part B. So for part B, where the f of z was, I'm going to put a 0. So I'm going to put 0 equals 2z minus 9 over 2z plus 1. Again, I'm going to think of that as 0 over 1, and I'm going to cross multiply. So I know that 1 times 2z minus 9 is still going to be 2z minus 9. Now 0 times all of that is still going to give me 0, isn't it? So look, we can just add 9 to both sides, 2z equals 9, divide by 2, and we come up with z equals 9 halves. So for part b, z equals 9 halves. Okay. I'm going to move my notes over to the right where I have some more room. Oops, sorry, where I have some more room. So part c, let me just write this down so I don't forget it, c is negative 1 half. Okay, so let's move this guy this way. And so we'll say for part C, negative 1 half equals 2z minus 9 over 2z plus 1. So I'm going to take this 2 times all of this right here. That's going to give me 4z minus 18. I'm going to multiply all this here by negative 1. That's just going to change my signs. Okay. And let's solve for z. So let's add 2z to both sides. So 6z minus 18 equals negative 1. We can add 18 to both sides. 6z equals 17. And if we divide by 6, I'm getting 17 over 6, right? So let me bring this back a little bit. Here, z equals 17 over 6. Sorry, it's a little messy. Okay. And I'm going to do part d right here so I don't have to keep moving back and forth. Okay, d equals 1. 
So 1 equals 2z over 9, 2z plus 1, and we cross multiply. So 1 times 2z minus 9 is still 2z minus 9. 1 times 2z plus 1 is still 2z plus 1. I want you to notice something here. When we subtract 2z on both sides, those pieces cancel and those pieces cancel, and all I'm left with is negative 9 equals 1, which is not true, and so there is no solution. So for part D, there is no solution, okay? Just can't do it. Can't get it done. Okay. All right. And the next part here says, determine if the following is a function or not. The set of whole numbers f of x, where x equals, or x is an element of that set, 1, 4, 9, 25, 36. Okay, so let's think about that for a minute. f of x equals the square root of x. We're going to find each of these values. Square root of 1 is 1, okay? Square root of 4 is 2. Square root of 9 is 3. Square root of 25 is 5. Square root of 36 is 6. Every one of these values had exactly one input. One input, one output, right? So same thing here. We've got a function, okay? All right. Look at the next one here. It says determine if the following is a function or not. f of x equals, this, uh, equals x plus 5. x are whole numbers. Okay, let's take whole numbers. 0 plus 5, I get 5. 1 plus 5, I get 6. 2 plus 5, I get 7. Do you see that no matter what number I plug in, I'm always just going to get one number. Whatever number I plug in, all I'm going to do is add 5 to it. So, once again, we've got ourselves a function. Okay. All right. So, the next poem here says, uh, A house was purchased for $60,000. After eight years, the value of the house was eighty-four. Find Express the values, house's value V of T in terms of of time, t, and years. Okay, so let's see if we can find a couple of things first. We know when we first bought it, so it was worth 60 grand. Eight years later, it was worth 84. So what I want to see if I can figure out is how much did it change in those eight years? So couldn't we take, say, 84,000 minus 60,000? And I would end, that would give me how much? Uh, 24,000, okay? And that was a period of eight years. So we would say for every year, the house went up by 3,000, right? Each year it went up by 3,000. So let's see if we can come up with a function, the value of the house. $3,000, it's gonna go up. That's why it's a positive three for every year. And when we first got it, it was worth 60000 And so this right here was telling me how much it was going up by. This right here was telling me how much it was when we first bought it. Okay. All right. So for the next problem here, it says a cab ride costs $1.20 plus 60 cents a mile. How far can we go on thirteen twenty? Okay, so we know that we have $13.20 in our pocket, right? We want to know how far can we go. Well, in order for me to get into this cab, oh, my pen froze up again. There we go. In order for me to get up into, into this cab, I got to spend $1.20. So you know what? Out of the $13.20, let's subtract $1.20. Now I got $12 left over. And then for every mile, they're going to charge me $0.60. Cents. So now that we have that, we can divide it by... 60 cents, okay? So I'm gonna grab, oops, that's not my calculator. 
That's not the one I want to use. Uh, let me see if I can close this one up here, guys, real quick. I can probably close it here. Close it. There we go. All right. This is the one I want to use. All right. Clear it out. And I'm going to take 12 divided by 0.60. And we can go about 20 miles, okay? So 20 miles. All right. Uh, let's see. This next one here says Crafty Bill's Cool Car Sales opened up a used car sales lot in 1991. The graph shows the number of cars sold as a function of time. What is the approximate number of cars sold in 1995? Okay, so I'm going to go down here. Here's 1995. Approximately, if I, looks like between seven and 800. So I would say about 750 cars, right? And I think that is all for, yep, that's all of 8.3.